Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, about the process of adaptation today. Uh, uh, although I didn't realize this until last night that that's what I was going to be speaking about. So, uh, uh, and I'm speaking about it because we've got, they've got a carton of uh, class, the adaptation of Paul Auster's novel that I made with the artist David Mazzucchelli, uh, which, uh, as, as you said, it was uh, very well received several years ago. Uh, it, comics have been adap adapted over the years. I'm sure many of you remember having classics comics illustrated when you were kids as a way of getting out of writing the term paper, actually having to, having to read the book. Uh, most classic comics, though, uh, are not faithful to the ma source material and aren't very good comics either. So I'm going to give you a little lesson today, just in case somebody should ask you, how do I adapt uh, a masterpiece into a comic book? Uh, and sometimes I find that y I'm a teacher, so pardon uh, the pedancy here, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, but that's, that's really my business. Uh, so in case somebody should ask you to adapt a, uh, you know, a masterpiece into a comic, this is sort of the recipe for doing it. Uh, sometimes I find, however, when I'm teaching something, that it's a really good idea to teach from bad example. So let's start with a really bad adaptation. There's the Partridge family, not only the Partridge family, but the grooviest, the Partridge family. And uh, we'll look at a very short story first from the Partridge family comic book. Uh, the Partridge family, what boy doesn't spend a lot of childhood and daydreams? What to be when I grow up, in quotes, you will find that Chris Partridge is, is no exception in The Boy in the Moon. How's that composition coming along, sweetheart? Oh, not so hot, Mom. Well, young man, what seems to be your problem? There's too many things I want to be when I grow up. Lawyer, cowboy, stockbroker, fireman, policeman, actor, astronaut, architect, doctor, dentist, teacher, engineer, reporter. Right now, I think I'll just enjoy being me. Is that a whole page? That's an entire page of a okay. comic story. But it's not the last page. Because this is a Partridge Family comic, it's very important that the two teen throbs that were actually uh, very popular at the time and selling the important merchandise appear somewhere in the story. How about it, Keith? What are you going to be when you grow up? A man on the moon? Very funny, Lori. But if I had Chris's imagination, I could be a boy in the moon. So why is this a bad ad adaptation of the uh, show? <laughs> the end. Uh, well, okay, so uh, the, the Partridge family, I mean, not that the Partridge family was, was that much better scripted than the Partridge family comic book, but at least it had a plot. This thing is a fairly uh, plotless thing. You, you get led in here thinking that it might be a very exciting story about Chris Partridge, uh, well, uh, you know, in uh, outer space and all these spaceships flying around. And then we have page two here. Mom's head is cut off in panel one. And it kind of looks like that lamp is sucking him out of like a, looks, a vacuum it, lamp it or looks, something. It looks like uh, they pause stills from uh, the show. Totally. Like that cropping of the... Um, of the shoulder and the lamp that you're talking about, that seems like something that would only come from looking at a still. Yep, and certainly the two faces are uh, drawn from photographs. And then just, a, 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 you know, if you are thinking about making a career as a cartoonist and the clock is ticking, your deadline is tomorrow, here's a really good way of killing a third of a page, just fill it up with random <laughs> words floating in space. That looks like a Steve, like a recent Steve Ditko comic. Actually, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The bottom section. Yep. And then there's, you know, a sassy little Chris with, suddenly the room has disappeared. He's standing in the middle of nothing, and there's this swirly thing behind him. And then Lori's growing out of uh, Keith's shoulder there. Okay, so it doesn't really, you know, this comic was designed just to sell a comic book, which is also filled with advertisements for Partridge Family merchandise in the back. Uh, it doesn't really care about being a comic, and it doesn't really care about being faithful, whatever that means, to the Partridge family. So now, uh, let's take a look at uh, a comic that, very briefly, a comic that really does does 
take its source material seriously, even if it's for satirical purposes. This is a couple of pages of a story by Harvey Kurtzman from 1953 from Mad Comics, uh, where they would sat satirize, and comic Mad was originally a comic book written, and written by Harvey Kurtzman, sketched by Harvey Kurtzman, and then different artists would do the finished work, in this case, Jack Davis. <coughs> The Classics Department. Hello, ready for another idiotic session of mad reading? Good. Today, in the continued interest of destroying the classics, we turn to a story long dear to our hearts and we present to you the mad version of that quaint and delightful classic, Alice in Wonderland. And Alice is screaming, It may be quaint by you, it may be delightful by you, it may be wonderful by you, but by me, it's only one thing, scary! Let me out of this for in a place! Uh, it's, I mean, so faithful that Jack Davis, the guy who did the drawings for the final here, is actually using the drawings of John Tenniel, uh, where he, and, and, and signs Tenniel's, uses Tenniel's, you know, signature over here in the left-hand corner. The original illustrator files. Really. Yeah, the original illustrator. Thanks, Dash. And uh, then his signature over here. And so Kurtzman is making satire here. And so his idea is to be very faithful to the source material and, and, as all good satirists do, reveal the truths behind them. But he's also, first and foremost, a cartoonist. So let's take a look at this page. You'll remember this sequence where Alice is eating and drinking and getting smaller and bigger and whatnot. Suddenly Alice came upon a table of solid glass with a tiny golden key on it, and beside the key a tiny bottle inscribed with the words, Drink Me. Since it would do her no good to open the tiny door, she turned to the bottle and finished it off. How curious! I must be shutting up like a telescope, said Alice. And now her size was okay, the door was okay, she went to get the key, but Alice was too small. So she grew big again from a cake that said, eat me, got key okay, went to door, but Alice was too big, drank more drink me bottle, size okay, door okay, went to get key, but Alice was too small, ate cake, key okay. Table okay, size okay, but the door was too big. More bottle, key okay, size okay, door okay, but the room was too small. More cake, door okay, size okay, table okay, but the key was too big. Bottle key okay, door okay, size okay, table okay, but the picture was too small. Okay, so... They're all laughing. It's yeah. funny. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I, I, you know, and this is completely out of context of the rest of the story, but you know, Kurtzman was a funny guy. Uh, so he's taking the, the, once again, the language starting out with, with, oh, with actual quotes from Alice. I, you remember that line, you know, I must be shutting up like a telescope comes straight from Alice. And then kind of bit by bit, and starts out with John Tenniel's drawing in panel one. And then bit by bit, Jack Davis takes over and the language becomes this crisp cut telegraphed English and look at how he's designed the page. Starts out slowly, two large vertical panels, speeds up in the middle, three squarer panels, and then down to the bottom of the page, you got four panels, and the, the, the words become these teeny little two, se two, two sentences become two word telegrams. And it goes bop it bop it bop it bop. And then finally, oh, the picture's too small. And the, and the way it's done is very kind of like illustration story, right? With the words along the top. Yeah, I mean yeah. that connects to what you're doing. And connects also to, to it, it being a work of literature, right? Uh, so I, I take my lessons from Harvey Kurtzman, which is to be very, very careful and respectful of the source material, and at the same time, let comics help tell the story in the way that comics work. So this City of Glass book, on sale at this store after <laughs> this lecture. Uh, I adapted with uh, the artist David Masichelli. And uh, people who have read both the novel by Paul Auster and read this graphic novel adaptation s often tell me how, how, m how true it seemed to Auster's novel. Uh, like, it has the same feeling as Auster's novel, even though it's done in pictures and Aus Auster's concerns have to do with the na nature of language. The book is about language and identity. Uh, but the trick here, and once again, like for those of you getting ready to adapt, you know, Ulysses into a comic form, if you want to capture the peaks and valleys of, of the original source material, 
the first thing I did was to create a ratio of story to pages. So we, the original City of Glass novel is 203 pages long. The comic is 120 20 pages. That's what we were given to work with. And so we had a ratio of 1.7 to 1. So for example, chapter 8, the original was 21 pages long in Paul Auster's novel. We had to tell that amount of story in 12.35 pages. So the book has the same contour as Auster's story with things that take a short period of time. You know, if you take a look at the classics comic of like The Three Musketeers, there might be, you know, 100 pages of exposition and finally there's a sword fight on page 35 that uh, page 135 that lasts for a paragraph. But in the comic classics comics version, it's short it lasts, you know, 3 or 4 pages because that's the action sequence. But here we were trying to stay close to what Auster was doing. So the first thing I did was to take, I uh, photocopied the entire thing, the ent Auster's entire novel, and underlined in blue the words we wanted to use. Because Auster gave the project his blessing with one caveat. He said, it's, you can't change a word that I've written. I'm a writer, I craft words, you can't change any words. Okay, fine, we won't change any words. So I underlined in blue the words we were using, and then I took a pink marker and underlined everything that we could show in pictures. And tried not to have the two things repeat themselves, because why well, have a character saying what he's doing? So you can save a lot of time in comics by doing that. And then I did a sketch of each page on a yellow legal pads, I don't know why yellow legal pads. It's just that's what I started on and that's what I kept working on. And I don't know why in blue pencil, just that's what I did. And uh, you can see there's white out here where I tried to sort of shorten the panels. And then I handed the entire monstrosity over to David Mazzucchelli, who is a marvelous artist and whose book, Asterius Polyp, I'm sure is available at this bookstore. And if you've not read it and bought it, <laughs> I highly recommend that you take a look at it, and it's really uh, one of the best books of the year. From what I heard, you had everything in a grid, and Matsu Kelly would break that grid. Yeah, so I had everything lined up in this three-by-three three grid like Harvey Kurtzman, because we're, well, we'll get to the, the reason why, and what David did was open it up. So he, like, this is David's sketch version of my, of, of the, of the drawing I just did. And he really gave it some air that wasn't there before. And it, it was a, one of the many strokes of brilliance that he brought to this project. Uh, and then we sat down with this version. Then I took it back and made some notes and some changes. We sat down with the whole thing and sat down with uh, Paul Auster uh, and Art Spiegelman, who was the series editor for, this, for these books, and went over every little paragraph and every period and hyphen. And then David went back and created this beautiful, beautiful art. And as you can see, you know, if you recall my first version of this, there was nine panels on each page. And David, you know, look at that first panel of, the, of sitting up on, on Upper Broadway, a beautiful rendering. Uh, David, David uh, uh, got his start as a professional cartoonist working for Marvel Comics, particularly with Daredevil. And so he really learned how to draw a city in perspective. <clears throat> so then the, the question was, I'll get back to that in a second. The, 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 another problem that we had with this adaptation was as soon as I hit panel pa chapter two, there's like a nine, ten page monologue by a character. This is a character who is, uh, in the book, was abused as a child, locked in a closet for most of his childhood, and came out kind of this babbling, strange, savanty kind of character. And how were we going to show what in the novel was nine or ten pages of, of monologue interesting uh, into a visual translation? Uh, so during the course of this monologue, and I'll read you the beginning of it because you'll get a sense of the weirdness of the way this character talks. He says, uh, no questions please. Yes, no, I am Peter Stillman. I say this of my own free will. That is not my real name. No, of course. My mind is not all it should be, no, but nothing can be done about that. 
This is called speaking. The words come for a moment and die. Strange, is it not? I myself have no opinion. If I can give you the words you need, you need, it will be a great victory. Thank you. Long ago, there was a mother and father. They say mother died. So, and then it gets even, the more he talks, the stranger it and gets. And took the whole thing word by word into that book. Right? Yeah, into took the, the whole comment. thing pretty much. I, well, I think I trimmed it some, but it does go on and on. And the way we made it interesting was to the, the idea that we're going on a, a uh, kind of uh, uh, tour through this tortured kid's soul. And so we followed this word balloon down and uh, it follows it down and then inside of him, unfortunately I'm missing a page here, I, I put this together in a rush last <laughs> night. I feel like a lot of the word picture combinations that you did in City of Glass have been very influential since then in a lot of alternative comics. Do you I think that's true? Well, yeah, I've, seen this, that? I've seen this, this business subsequently. I don't think I ever saw this thing with the word balloon going down into someone's mouth before, but I've no, seen no, it. No, no, but the, this whole, particular the, whole, thing. the book is a whole, you know. I, I, don't, I guess so. Yep, I guess so. So this, this it, we go down into this, this character's, you know, he's still talking this monologue, and we've gone down his throat. Uh, here it goes, there's Charon, the, the uh, you know, character from Greek mythology, who's, who's our escort into the netherworld the underworld of this guy uh, inside of him. And then this page is, the speaker is the, the caveman's paintings, the earliest picture uh, writing. And then we zoom in, get closer and closer, and Do then... Do you think this is mm -hmm. kind of a cinematic thing, like where... It's cinematic ex to a point, but once again, it's really something that you can only do in comics. And uh, very specifically, what I'm about to explain here, where the tail of the balloon goes down into the grate <coughs> of the sewer and then down the drain and then down the Victrola and then down the well and in the bird's mouth and in the comic strip in the newspaper and then this dog turd and then all of these separate images, the rabbit, the, the booze, the, the mouth, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally we get to the end of his speech and it, the nine panel grid has become a jail cell and we go down even further and he's now a broken puppet as a marionette lying in this pool way, way deep, 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 deep down into a soul. So how do we keep, to keep this, to keep the, to, to achieve a certain momentum there and keep the reader interested, we play this little comics trick, which is the first two pages here are just one subject. Here are the cave paintings, and then oh, here are the Charon, and then the cave paintings, and now each of those tiers, one, two, three, they become sets of three, one, two, three, one, two, three, the drain, one, two, three, the Victrola, and then doublets. The well is two panels, the bird is two panels, the newspaper is two panels, the dog turd is two panels, and then single panels. So it's that same thing that Harvey Kurtzman was doing, like the, the, you see how the velocity, of the, if you're reading this, you start kind of reading it faster. You're down to single pictures, and then kablam, the, the jail cell, and then the rim shot. So, like, that's the, it's cinematic, yeah, but it's like only uh -huh. can you do this in comics. And, and so you're using the, the power of the language of comics to actually tell your story. And one last example here. The, this three by three grid turned out to be a very useful thing, although David did break the wall and breathe some air in here. The three by three grid uh, turned into uh, a useful metaphor for this main, this is the main character here. He's a, he's a novelist named Quinn who takes it upon himself to become a detective. And during the course of the story, we not only used this grid, but we also hit it so that you would sort of subconsciously notice it in places without really even seeing it. It's kind of a little trick that we played on the reader. So in the middle of this, in the middle of this nine panel grid is, is another nine panel grid hidden in there, which is the window. And here behind the woman on the rocking chair, there it is again. And here at the bottom of the page, do you see it? 
the telephone, the nine buttons of the telephone. You know, there's a lot of talk about literary comics now. Do you th what do you think about that term, or do you think that this is a literary comic? And I had another question I wrote mm. down. Mm. Sorry to spring this on you. That's okay. Um, do you think that there are uh, li there's literature or prose writers who are comic booky, or what that would be like? Hmm. Well, yeah, you know, like I'm a big fan of uh, Cavallo, and I think that he's got kind of a comic. He wrote that book, Cosmic Comics, and it's just, uh -huh. it feels like a comic. I don't know if I can be any more articulate than that. But, uh, yeah, there's some, right, like Carl Sandburg's writing to me is very, com com it's, it's just kind of moves in a way that I, I see comics when I read it. Maybe that's what it is. Uh -huh. Maybe it's as simple as that. And then this, do you think, of, like, when you hear about literary comics now, do you think it's kind of, you can picture it as a book as you're reading the comic, or well, I think do that you think the City of Glass is like that? Yeah, I think City of Glass is like that. I think Body World is like that. You know, I think Body World's a very satisfying read as, as like, I, the, the whole term graphic novel to me has always been kind of something I've been somewhat uncomfortable with, but I, because I think there's so few examples of uh, long comics, you know, long comics that read as novels. When I finished Body World the other night, for the second time, the first time in color, I really felt, oh, okay, I read a novel. And it's not just its length, it's, less, it's like multi-layered the way a novel is. A lot of comics only go first or second layer, and I think something well like this... Is in isn't um, that because of the restrictions that were put on the cartoonist most of the time, like mm -hmm. producing something serialized or working in... A certain in genre. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and those, those restraints are no longer present. So you don't think, uh, when you think graphic novel you feel more like it means like a book not like like prose or something about reading words yeah it has something to do with the, with the book ish quality to it somehow yes and 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 subtexts and metatexts as well so so just to finish my point here uh, all through this novel we get this rigidity towards the end of this story this character uh, starts losing his mind and he really loses his identity not his mind he loses his, his sense of self. And so we began to uh, play with, this is towards the end of the book, and you see how there's an extra space in the gutter there. And here, the panels start pulling apart, just as he starts losing it. This is the same guy as the, in the beginning of the novel, except now he's been through hell. And he's somehow ended up in this abandoned building, and time is very getting very strange. And you know, his food just kind of appears out of nowhere, and he's kind of reminiscing about what he's, what he's been thinking about losing him, himself. And the pages begin to bring apart, break apart. So the very structure of the comics of the page are, are pulling apart until eventually the panels start jostling. And this is the end of this guy's existence within this book, and fall off into that same well, that same bottomless pit as the young man's, and eventually they just kind of swirl off and off the page. So you're actually using, once again, what I was, uh, the, 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 the medium to help propel and tell the story. Well, you don't even realize that you've been looking at that, that rigid, rigid grid as a symbol of the guy's sanity. You don't even notice it until you get towards the end of the book, and these, these panels start flipping around, and you're like, oh... There we go. And this is really a, meta a metaphor for what's happening in his mind, too, right? Absolutely. Like, th the thing that I feel about with, with literature or all, all word books is that it feels like it's always interior, mm. you know? And you never, like, see someone, mm. what someone's doing. And it can say someone steps into a room and I don't necessarily stop to imagine what that room looks like. Mm -hmm. I just keep reading. Mm -hmm. But in comics or in drawings, you're always seeing something, like if someone steps into a room, you know what that room looks like. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And it feels less interior to me. And a lot of the scenes in City of Glass, I think, um, have that words as interior and pictures as exterior. I think it mostly in the first mm -hmm. part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Dan Klaus talks about that too, right? Where, where people's interior selves are in the words, and then, do you remember he had yes. a quote about that? Yes, yes, yes. We're let into their interiors, and actually, that's an interesting thing about body world, too. Uh, I'm trying to make a segue. 
but it that's is the end of your presentation. That's the end of my presentation. But, so, uh, but it, it's one of the cool things about Body World, uh, which has a lot of uh, I interior thoughts, and the way that you s you write that that those thoughts is very different from the way that uh, people's a actions are and what they say, because I think that people like. Thoughts, thoughts are quite different things, and a lot of, lot of Body World's a really trippy, fantastic book. Uh, uh, that I, no, I really, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I recommend it very highly. Um, in in Body World, there's a lot of going in, people going into other people's heads. There's this strange drug. That <laughs> well, <laughs> the idea, the idea is on is that it's like telepathy. I can I can yeah. go to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the idea is that in most telepathy and fiction, it's like reading, um, like what we were just talking about. Actually, let me see if we can get it. View show. Okay. M um, y most telepathy, like if Professor X is speaking to someone, it's usually just someone is receiving words in their mind, or it's like a whisper between two characters um, that is unheard by other people, and this whisper is is um unself conscious you know like in a movie if someone if someone is given telepathic powers they'd walk into this bookstore and everyone would w would be talking but they without their words moving and they would be saying things about how they're feeling unself consciously like oh i hate my wife or i hate my life right now and that's what everyone's thinking and i and i don't really agree that telepathy would work that way um and so I was in, uh, I mean, honestly, I was just really bored thinking about how I thought telepathy would work for a very long time. Um, and I thought that it would be instead of, okay, like m most telepathy is if a computer is one person, another computer is another person, you're burning the information onto a disk and then you're uploading it to the other computer. So instead of that, which would just be a v one very small part of the brain, which is whatever part of your brain is thinking in word form, it would be all of yourself turning into the other self. Because if your brain is going to become like the other person's brain, then your hand would know what it's like to be the other person's hand, and your foot like the other person's foot. And it would have to happen in stages. Um, so like at the very beginning stage, would be things that exist today, like I can kind of sense that someone's upset, or I have um, very extremely low-level telepathy. Um, you know, if you come home and you can just kind of feel like so, or if you're if you're if you're doing figure drawing and you're and you're drawing another person and you kind of get a sense through doing that of what it's like to be in their hand or or to sit inside of their body. It's a very high-level telepathy where you would have you would basically be the other person and have all of the associations with objects or places and smells that the other person would have. Um, and then, well, it just goes from there. You'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> um, and this is what the book looks like. Um, it was originally serialized online in this vertical format. So that means there weren't any actual physical pages. Um, it was a long scroll on the computer, and I did that for a lot of different reasons. A lot of them are really boring. Um, but I like comics that have a flow, like Bottomless. It flows right the whole time, and so you can track the movement from page to page across. It ma makes reading um, so much more enjoyable and, and making it more of a roller coaster ride. Like a lot of, a lot of comics I read, you're, it's like page one, page two, and you s you always have to restart and reorient yourself on the next page. And I feel like it's constantly taking me out of just following the characters to be like, this page has this cool layout, and I oh, I have to start on this panel and not that panel, even though that panel is bigger or something. If I think the vertical orientation of Body World is actually, if you get used to it, um, makes following the characters a lot easier because it's just one long scroll, scroll flowing waterfall of reading. Yeah, you just scroll down. Scroll down. It wasn't, it wasn't 
you didn't flip the page. So here, this is the book open, and those maps on the right would open on maps as different tabs on the computer. So you would reference the maps as you read. Like, can can I have that? So you know, you can read like. You know, it opens this so you can read it like this. Uh, no, well, the, um, because the majority of this story takes place in Boney Borough, this fictional forest town. Um, and so it allows you to keep track of where all of the characters are. And you don't really have to, I mean, you don't have to reference the maps if you don't want to. It's fun, though. And this is Paul fun. thinks it's fun. I just think I if... If you open a book and it has character guides and maps, it's like automatically better than other books. Okay. <laughs> you know, they the books just look more fun. Yeah. And it feels more like you're going to take a trip into another place. Because if you're, if you're drawing a comic, you want to travel and go on a vacation. Paul's modeling the book. Um, you want to travel to another place and spend a lot of time there and so I try to make the whole book consistent to that environment so I know so body world has a consistent look and um this book bottomless belly button has a consistent look that's specific to the place that that story takes place in I noticed that does that make sense the, well the drawing's quite different in the two books that's true uh, well, it's be, I mean, it's a whole bunch of different reasons. I, it's because the bottomless world has those kinds of drawings and body world has it, these kinds of drawings. And also how they were made, like bottomless belly button came together in the editing. So all the drawings are a little bit shitty. Like if I had an idea for a scene, I could just draw the scene and then decide how to where to put it in or if I should put it in. It was more like trying, trying to... Uh, like most comics, you can't do that because it just takes so long to draw a page. And so if you spend a month drawing a sequence in your comic, you don't want to just toss it out, you know? Yeah, definitely. So, I, I, so I, then, uh, so I could, if I had an idea for a scene, I could just draw it. Mm. And, um, but Body World, all of the pages were really complicated and they took a long time to do just technically to execute. So I, so, um... If I finished a page, I knew it would go into the final book. Um, Body World's a combination of a lot of different things. It's uh, It all starts with ink drawings, and then I would print those ink drawings onto acetate sheets like animation cells, um, and then paint the back or on another layer of the acetate sheet, and I would combine that with computer colors that are done on color separations. You can th That's kind of embarrassing. Um, but that's like an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, well, that I printed. Out, and then when you're done ev compiling everything, you can print it out and paint over the printout and scan it back in. Does this make any sense? This sounds really boring if you're, if you're not like... No, I don't have a Wacom. Um, and I know about as much... I know like the paint bucket tool in Photoshop. That's what I use for... That's m the extent of my Photoshop knowledge. Um, but it has that look because Photoshop itself is based on using acetate sheets because all of the magazines pre-Photoshop would use acetate because they would have to send the printer physical copies of what they would shoot. So like in Photoshop, it has different layers. You know, that comes from printing everything on different acetate sheets that would be layered over each other. And these, uh, you know, pre-Photoshop coloring is really... Um, incredibly boring to hear about if you're not interested, but it's really fascinated, fascinating if you get into it. Um, and just looking at, at um, comics and animation b before computers changed them to see how they did things. Like this, um, you know, I do animation too, and this is a film strip, and the animation I do um, is kind of like the comics in that I use pre-computer animation techniques, but compile it on the computer. So like instead of uh, instead of having a camera take a picture of the image, I just scan it and you can layer you can line it up on the computer the way they used to line up film. So um, it's like does that make any sense? All right. I'll show some of those animations. 
Animation 2, I think, was a big influence just on the storytelling of uh, of a lot of my comics in Bottomless Belly Button. There's like mo- mo- moments that are broken down for lots of panels that are kind of like this. If you look at a film strip of an animation, like in, in Bottomless Belly Button, someone will put on their shoes for six panels or take off their shirt for like 40 panels because we're breaking. I'm br- I enjoy breaking down the movement to see how someone does something. Because if you're animating and you're not doing a uh, rotoscope or, or flash animation, you're sitting at your table and you're really thinking about how someone would step forward in space and break that down in time and, and draw it at 12 frames per second, or how someone would sweep these pills off of the table and what their hand would look like as they did it. And it makes you really conscious of your body and how you move and do things. Um, yeah, and just the backgrounds themselves and kind of this Hanna-Barbera aesthetic. And this kind of explains that. So that's a, this is a, a still from a show that I have at the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art now. So like the lower right-hand corner, that's a background layer that I would then place behind the things in the computer. And the center one is the line art that I print onto the acetate and paint the back of the acetate sheets. This is all, this whole thing is actually explained in the cover for The Unclothed Man, which is on an acetate sheet. That's a book I did. And I, you know, that's more about animation, comics, storyboards. Yeah, like here, it's kind of breaking down a performance, I think, comes from uh, animation. It's kind of, a, it's unusual because most comics, like what Paul was saying, were done um, monthly serialized, so they would be 24, 32 page installments. And so it'd be unusual to have a scene go on for 10 pages where there's a more of a real back and forth between characters um, because it would just be a ripoff, you know, to, to spend that much time in, in, uh, in one scene. A lot of those comics have two characters talking, um, and it's like, paragraph, 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 paragraph of text, and then an image of the two characters that kind of summarizes their relationship. While the comics that I do and a lot of the Japanese comics that I like and grew up reading would have um, longer scenes between characters where we could, like this, this is like an Oscar performance from Billy here. This actually is kind of like the Partridge Family comic. Um, This is a comic adaptation I did of an episode of Blind Date. Um, And this is more like just thinking about film or film and comics. A lot of my comics are body world and bottomless. You know, I don't draw from um, photos or life. It's just from uh, imagination. And you're sitting at the table thinking about... um, so everything ends up a little weird, like the cars in Body World are messed up. They don't look like real cars, or maybe they're too small. Um, but I got really into watching Blind Date, and uh, and so I wanted to do an adaptation where I would just take out the uh, the commentary. You know, they have these commentary that makes fun of the characters as they uh, as they go on their date. And so I just stripped it down just to what they would say, and I would draw from the screen like observational drawing. And it ends up with things like with that Partridge Family comic, weird compositional things that you wouldn't have thought about um, when you're sitting just at your, ta- at your drawing table. And it's also exciting um, because Blind Date's weird because it's, it's reality, but really fake. Like the people did actually say those things and do, and do those things, but it was in a completely fake environment. Um, and so they just say things and do things that you would never come up with, you know? And you can read it. Like it's the only comics I've done that I can read and kind of laugh at and enjoy because I didn't, I didn't write them. Um, um, yeah, these colors, too, come from kind of looking at YouTube screens where things look a little sickly and weird. Um, so. Oh, this is another still from a cartoon. Oh, this is a, co- this is a comic I did called My Entire High School Sinking Into the Sea. Um, and this is just, this was kind of the first 
I would draw in a really like cartoony style, I guess. And I started just working in a more illustrative way with non um non real realistic colors as just kind of an emotional layer because if you can you can look at the drawings and just understand what's going on and so I don't think you would necessarily have to have um an apple be red or something it can just be the line drawing and then the colors can exist on a separate plane it almost looks like they're superimposed on a Mark Rothko painting yeah those are like here I'll show this is a spi this is a Spider-Man comic that I did recently um what I don't know yeah this is Spider-Man he's Mysterio has captured him This was done for the n upcoming volume of Strange Tales the m a Marvel anthology Yeah they're doing another one Yeah I did that Doctor Strange one and it was so exciting it was the first job I got after I graduated college and I really thought like I was going to be a professional cartoonist because <laughs> Marvel hired me. I got it like the week after I graduated. Um, and how I got it, but it was only four pages and it doesn't pay anything. And then I didn't, and then I had to move back to Richmond. It was a momentary uh, idea. It was really confusing. I mean, honestly, I didn't, um, well, I don't know if I can, I want to talk about SVA. <laughs> talk about SVA. This is a uh, um a page from a comic that I'm working on now and it's about um these people are have built uh, a theme park on an island and um the theme park is is d divided into different time periods like Epcot's different uh different places you know so this theme park has a 40s world and a 50s world and a 60s world um and <laughs> and uh and these uh n this theme park's going to open and all and now all of these tourists are going to come to this island and they don't speak english on the island so they get um they s hire some um english students to come over and teach english to the locals here because they'll have to talk english to the tourists so here they are, um, these are the people at the park and their scouting locations. Um. <laughs> oh, and this is a still from a longer animation that I'm working on now. I'm going to show some, I'm going to show an animation. So this is an animation I did for Bottomless Belly Button and um, I just drew it on 8.5 by 11 computer paper with a Sharpie at this guy's house, Dave Kirsch there in the back for a little bit of it. Um and then I uh and then I just line it up on the computer. What do you mean line it up? Like I scan you have a stack this high mm -hmm. and then you scan it and as you scan it you number zero zero one to seven twenty. Mm -hmm. Um and then in After Effects you hit load and it shows up in order and then I made it brown instead of black ink to match the book and then you hit play and, and then you see animation. it yeah you it just it. yeah and then you see it so you're just doing these ca I mean I that's why uh, the pacing for a lot of my animations are kind of wonky this is one I did for body world later I tried to uh, um, this one I added more I got it a little more complicated with it. I mean, this is basically the same thing as the other one but I would like that background is cut paper and since each one is done separately it has this flickering effect. What um, do you mean each one is done separately? I mean I, t I look at each frame separately so the colors don't match. Oh, my friend added this to it.
um, when I when I very, I mean, it's a it's a long story, but um, I was just really frustrated with publishing and and books in general, and and it was something something that still bothers me, because I had done Bottomless, and it was such a long project, um, and then I sent it to, to I handed it to Gary Groth at a uh, comic. Um, comic convention and he said he was kind of interested like maybe in doing it um, and then I would send him like as I was working on it what what where I was at and I just wouldn't hear anything and all of the experiences I've had with publishers before that would always be like a friend saying yeah I'll publish your work and then they would print it and it would be awesome but they wouldn't they just wouldn't sell any copies and you'd feel like a asshole you know and you and it would like kind of be hard on your friendship with this person if they lost a bunch of money on your book and you just felt bad like if you if the books don't sell like why even why print them you know um or there would be or it would be a case where the printer would have like no like uh, the, that mother's mouth book through alternative like i i think i met the publisher once you know and I just had no contact with them, and and when I got it, it was just kind of a surprise, and I I like I didn't get like a te it was just not a good ideal relationship to have with a publisher, all these weird surprises in the book. Anyway, the point is that I was really upset with that, and then when he fo then all right, I had Bonless gave it to him, and then I just thought they're not gonna do they're not gonna publish it. I'm just gonna ser put do work online because then I can have total control over it and I don't have to um, feel bad asking people to print it. I don't have to annoy publishers and write them like, did you get my comic yet? I really want to be printed. You know, it's just, um, um, uh, soul crushing activity. <laughs> um, so if I did it online, I would have total control over it. It would be a completely immediate because the time it takes between when you finish something and when it comes out is really frustrating as well because when I found out that Bottomless would that the Fantagraphics was going to publish Bottomless it was because I bumped into fa to Gary Groth at a convention and I said did you get you know the end of the book and he said oh yeah we're going to print that next year like he didn't even email me or anything and then it was a whole other year and so I just thought I just thought I don't want to participate in this um started doing it online and I kind of knew that eventually it would be printed. I mean, I kept files of everything in high resolution. Um but I didn't I don't know. I also sort of half-heartedly tried to do it as a monthly series because I wanted it to be ser to be serialized to come out as it was online um in little installments. Um but no one was going to publish it, you know not a book like body like i like body world i s gave it to dark horse and they didn't write me back they wrote only wrote me back after i said somewhere that they never wrote me back <laughs> hosting the site oh it's like nothing but i didn't have get a lot of traffic i mean only a, i think a, a few people actually would follow it online because everything was designed as a scroll and so when it was translated to a book I wanted to keep that format, so that's what gives it the ver vertical orientation. And I made a lot of changes for the book. I, I added a lot of pages. I added chapter illustrations. Um, I would change all the colors throughout the book because when I was originally doing it for online, I would favor colors um, that I thought looked good on a computer, especially a cyan color like that looks nice illuminated from behind. So for all of those colors I would change it for the print version and also I think flat colors look better on a computer screen while in print I like more textured colors so it just involved going through the whole book and printing out the pages and working over them again and scanning it back in um, for the book version what else did I do I did a lot of th I did made a lot of changes I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do things online, I feel like. Books, uh, I feel like books and c comic books and cartoonists 
um, have this kind of old timey thing that I don't like. I like it that if you're online, you're doing, uh, you're participating in some kind of contemporary or maybe futuristic culture, you know? Do you know what I mean? The old timeiness? Oh, yeah, I totally know what you mean. And, and, and I'm part of the. Uh what you don't like, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I've got, because I've got an old set of eyes or something, I, I really like to sit in, uh, I, I read some of Body World online, but I vastly prefer the experience of having the book in my lap and turning the pages and reading it like that. Although, I, that said, uh, you know, reading Body World, which runs vertically, is a, quite a different page-turning experience. Uh, it's not it's not hung up on the the you know when you're flipping a c comic book the, that last panel on the bottom right is really key mm -hmm. and a lot hinges on the weight of that that's for for example that's that's gone but still I l I just like to sit in uh, with a book on my lap and that's just because I'm an old fart I I have a question for you all of your projects art like with City of Glass and Fletcher Hanks and the ride together and um, um, yeah the Fletcher Hanks afterward it feels like you're you're making decisions before you go to it this is a weird question like I don't know what a Paul Karasak drawing looks like mm. or if you have a sketchbook and why can't you just like sit down and just draw a comic you know mm. how come uh, well, it's a little bit like what you were saying before about how, um, you know, bottomless belly button looks a certain way because there was a certain story that you were telling, and uh, body world looks a, w a certain way because there's a certain story that you're telling. And so uh, I figure out what the story is that I'm going to tell, and then I find the way to draw it that I think tells the story the best way. But that said, I also feel uh, I have a certain lack of self-confidence in my own sort of natural drawing style. Although I think if you were to take a look at my sketchbook, you would see there's... Oh, so there's you do have a sketchbook. Oh,